Thank you, Moira. Thank you, everybody, uh, for um, very kindly allowing me this platform to speak to you today on my very favorite subject, Motor Launch 286. So my life in the movies, performing the archaeology of World War I Motor Launch 286. Well, when I was growing up in Vancouver, Canada, there's one thing that I wanted more than anything. I wanted a life in the performing arts, in theater, and in the movies. And so this is what I got. <laughs> and I couldn't be happier with the way that things have turned out. So why are motor launches known as movies? Well, Lieutenant Eric P. Dawson, who served um, in the motor launch patrol, said um, that the, the movies um, basically gave you the dreadnought stomach. Um, there's something about this name movie which seems to fit. For the ML is nothing if not movement. You require sea legs, sea arms, sea head, and a kind of armor-plated stomach well described as the dreadnought type. So they were very, very mobile in the water. And the, those are photographs of me submerged in ML-286, cleaning and recording her. So I want to talk about the history and uh, the archaeology of ML-286. And then I'll be speaking about the Auxiliary Patrol Areas 2 and 3, Orkneys and Shetlands, of which she was a part of their patrol. And then I'll talk a little bit about my practice research project, Still Life Movie, and then my final concluding thoughts. So where is ML-286 today? She is no longer in Orkney. She's actually tucked away in a little um, beautiful kind of scenic uh, boatyard landscape between the dry dock of BJ Wood and Son Boatyard and Isleworth 8, and that's in West London. And just further down the River Thames, you've got this beautiful Anglo-Saxon fish trap. So she's in a very beautiful, restful space. And this is her from the, the dockyard point of view. You can see how she's rotting away there. So this is me engaging with ML-286. So in 2019, we actually did a massive clean up of uh, the vessel because she was being featured on Digging for Britain. And, um, and, and so working with a, um, an archaeology foreshore group, um, I was volunteering with them and we gave her a really good clean. So this is a close up of one of her portholes. And then you can see her collapsed deck. And then I actually went under the deck and I took this photograph. And you can see that the mud is not sort of like your regular mud. It's this oozy quicksand mud. And I remember being stuck in it. And I had the, the project officer and another fellow lift me out of my boots because I was just stuck. So it's very much like quicksand. And this is just a, a lovely close-up um, of uh, her bow. And again, you can see the, the collapsed deck there uh, in, the, in the photograph. So when we were cleaning and recording her, one of the volunteers found her capstan, and that was a really lovely find. So we cleaned that up a bit, and we recorded it and took some photos. It's now buried in situ with the vessel. Now, ML-286 is also part of community engagement. That's a really important aspect of the vessel's life, her new use life, as it were. So um, sometimes for the Totally Thames Festival, there will be guided walks to the vessel, and you can go and hear stories uh, about her history and the archaeology. So this is one of my favorite pictures, me and ML-286, that was taken by a very good friend of mine. And this was really the, the impetus of my research. So the very first essay I ever wrote when I was doing my master's degree at Birkbeck, University of London, was about ML-286. And so then I was looking into her stories. Who served on her? Where was she patrolling? What was this life of this shipwrecked vessel in this boatyard? So this is a really nice before and after photograph. So the photo to the right um, is when she was an abandoned houseboat in the 1980s, just left at BJ Wood and Son Boatyard, and the other pictures of her in December 1918. Um, so ML-286 was um, prefabricated in Bayonne, New Jersey, as all 550 motor launches were. So the British Admiralty went to visit a, a fellow called Henry R. Sutphin, and he was the general manager of the electric launch company Elko in Bayonne, New Jersey. And the British Admiralty had ordered originally 50 of these vessels to be built. 
And after the sinking of the Lusitania on the 7th of May in 1915, an extra 500 were ordered. Now, there was a problem when Henry R. Sutphin agreed to take this on. Um, the United States was neutral in the war at this point in time. So they were prefabricated in Bayonne, New Jersey, and sent up to Quebec, Canada to be assembled. Then they were sent down by rail to Halifax, shipped across the Atlantic to Great Britain, and they served out of almost every port in Great Britain and the Mediterranean. So ML-286, after she had um, served in the Orkneys, which I'll tell you a little bit about in a moment, um, she was retired in Southampton. She was stripped of her engines, as most of the MLs were, and she was then a houseboat and called Cordon Rouge. In the 1930s, she had a bit of a, a change of ownership and a name change as well, and she became known as Eothen. And it was Eothen, as she was known as, when she was also a Dunkirk little ship. So this vessel is a veteran of two world wars. Now, it's interesting with her materiality, the reuse life of the material. So Stephen Wood, who is the current owner of BJ Wood and Son Boatyard, his father sold off the wheel, the binnacle, and the Dunkirk plaque. And I tracked them down, and they are now aboard a houseboat. And I give a great thanks to Hubert Selby, who allowed me to go onto his houseboat and photograph uh, ML-286's original wheel and her binnacle. So the materiality of the vessel goes beyond, it extends beyond her boatyard landscape. Now here's where we get to the auxiliary patrol areas two and three, Orkneys and Shetlands. I can't tell you how many hours, wonderful hours, but very long hours in the National Archives queue looking through these naval documents. And I was searching for ML-286 and eventually I found her. She appears in May in 1917, and I chose this particular um, uh, page from those documents because it's the 26th of May, 1917. So even though we're the 27th of May today, 106 years ago, it was the 26th. And, um, and it just shows uh, her, her patrol duty there. Um, and it says, um, all standing by for night duty. So ML-286 was a part of that. So again, we just continue on. The, the naval documents are divided into two volumes per year. So you go January to June and then July to December. And so here she is, uh, ML-286, uh, in Swithaboom, ready for the night striking force. And again, there's another record of her in Swithaboom. Kirkwall, Long Hope Harbor Patrol duty, the Pentland Firth, she was all a part of the, the, the auxiliary patrol area. And there's a picture of me looking very tired after going through so many of these documents and scrutinizing every page and, and finding um, ML-286. So these documents are really invaluable, and they even talk about the repair work that ML-286 needed. So uh, the week ending August uh, 10th, 1918, um, she had a new circulating discharge pipe fitted, and on the 12th of October, um, she had a, a bolt fitted to the rudder shoe. And then the, the very end uh, image there is when ML-286 was retired, so she left base en route for Southampton, Hermione, to pay off, and that was on the 16th of, no of October 1918. So this is one of my favorite uh, quotes from Sub-Lieutenant Rupert Brooke, who served with the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. He and his best friend, British composer, Sub-Lieutenant William Dennis Brown. Uh, Sub-Lieutenant Brown was killed in Gallipoli, and Rupert Brooke died of septicemia on the island of Skiros when he was bitten by a mosquito. And it was Brown who um, chose the burial place for his friend. Um, but Rupert Brooks says, they say that the dead die not, but remain near to the rich heirs of their grief and mirth. And I truly believe that my thesis, my project, is really ghost-led. And I am dealing with the spirit of ML-286, and I'm dealing with the spirit of her many ghosts, who I've just put myself into their hands to guide me along this path. So when I was devising this project, because um, my, my research is transdisciplinary, so I interpret the vessel and her stories through theater, through performance, and I was looking at multi-narratives, archival. Um, I've got lots of first edition books uh, of men who served in the Royal Naval Volunteer Reserve. I looked at poetry, Rupert Brooke, Keats, Tennyson. Um, Lieutenant Gordon S. Maxwell called himself Tennyson Maxwell, Dover sailor poet. 
And, um, and I put these narratives together, and then I was also interviewing my research participants. So um, there's a picture of myself with uh, Dr. Samantha Brummage. She and I cleaned and recorded the vessel. You've got Dr. Martin Bates, a geoarchaeologist. In the center there is my good friend David Judson, who's a sea shanty singer. We sing together at the London Sea Shanty Collective. Um, I'm also standing there with my good friend Russell. He cleaned and recorded the vessel. And even the Canadian geese came in and, and gave their two honks worth. So they, it all got in my script, believe me. Um, so then there was the task, all these narratives. So I had to curate them. I had to kind of put them into typologies. But then my actor's hat came back on. And if you think about Shakespeare, you've got your tragedies, your comedies, and your histories. Well, that's what this project was. You have, there's, there was a lot of comedy that I discovered. Um, you know, the, the boys put on a vaudeville show, the Zeebrugger concert, two days before the raids on Zeebrugger and Ostend. Um, there was tragedy with people being killed. Um, and there's, of course, the history. So I had to, and I wanted to create different themes as well. So, for example, fraternization with the enemy. Um, there's a, a, a really poignant story where a British officer takes a German officer off barbed wire and he carries him across to the German line and the firing ceases. Nobody can believe this has happened. And the commander in the German trench comes forward and gives the British officer um, the Iron Cross. So all these things, war is not black and white. It's definitely shades of gray. And I really wanted my project to um, reflect that. So I went about making my sets and my props, and I made a replica of ML286's transom. And this was really important for me because um, I was really influenced by um, the work of Sally M. Foster and Sean Jones. They wrote a great book called uh, My Life is a Replica, um, the St. John's Cross Iona. And they were saying that you know replicas are very important. They have their own agency and their own authenticity. And what that transom allowed me to do, the replica, was to take my show into other venues. And I had to learn semaphore, and I made a little Dunkirk flag. Now, by hand, I'm not an artist, but in one go, I, I reproduced by hand the original Zeebrugger concert poster. And the source of that is in Maxwell's book. Um, it was originally illustrated by Nina Scott Langley, and so there it is. So this is what I mean. They were performing two days before the raids on Zeebrugger and Ostend. And what's really tragic is that the main actor, Lieutenant Oswald Robinson, Professor D.B. Robinson, was the second ML officer killed during those raids. And Maxwell writes about that, and I performed that in my script. And I created my own logo as well, which my friend Aidan helped me to Photoshop to look a bit more slick. That was just a proud selfie moment because I couldn't believe I did it, especially that rabbit. But if you look at that poster, it's, it's funny. It says dinghies at 11 p.m. And instead of stage manager, they've got stage damager. So there is this kind of lightheartedness. You, you have to find humor somewhere, otherwise you, you will go crazy for your mental health. So then I had my institute performance in the vessel. She came out in all her glory. It was a wonderful day in July. So my three supervisors, Dr. George Burroughs, Dr. Vincent Adams, and my first supervisor, Dr. Erica Hughes, and I performed for them. Now, my show is only 45 minutes, and that was basically I didn't want my audience to be swept away at high tide. So the, believe me, the tide dictates everything. And also 45 minutes is enough, I think, for um, such a, a heavy topic. Um, then, again, with my replica transom, I did an in-situ performance at the White Swan Studio at Portsmouth University. And if you look at that poster, uh, the picture where I got my arms out, that really came in handy. So, again, going back to Lieutenant, Sub-Lieutenant Rupert Brooke, when she sleeps, her soul I know goes a-wander on the air, wings where I may never go, leaves her lying still and fair, waiting empty, laid aside like a dress upon a chair. Well, when I was rehearsing with my transom, the transom became my wings, and then I decided, why don't I fold her up and lay the replica against a chair? And that will mirror Brooke's words. And I only got that through the transom. So again, there is the importance of replicas. And it's an extension of her materiality because I painted that replica with the mud from the boatyard. Then moving on to Tag in Edinburgh, 
Um, so Dr. Benjamin Geary very kindly invited me to talk about um, poetry, movie motion, um, poetic champions compose. Now this was really important. Oh, I took a picture of the Pentland Room because the Pentland Firth and where ML286 was serving. But this is where I met Dr. Helen Spencer and everything changed when all of a sudden I go from reading about Swithaboom, Scapa Flow, Long Ho Harbor, uh, Kirkwall, and there I am. So again, this is a ghost-led production. The spirit of my boys brought me here. So I really would like to thank Dr. Helen Spencer and Scarf and Surfa for that trip of a lifetime. It meant the world to me. And then, of course, in the Scapa Flow Museum, Lieutenant Alfrey's painting. Now, Lieutenant Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey was a war artist. He was the commander of ML-286, and his picture, Submarine Ship, in... Uh, coming into uh, Kirkwall was painted in 1917. Now, very tragically, Lieutenant Jeffrey Stephen Alfrey was killed on the 29th of September 1918. By this point, he was no longer commander of ML-286. He was in command of ML-247. His ML um, ran into gale force winds and hit or rock and exploded on impact. Now, Alfrey was a very good swimmer, and he gave his life preserver to one of his crew, and it was the crew member... Um, who was the sole survivor, and Alfrey's body was never found. And there he is there. So, Alfrey lives on with me because I had the wonderful experience of performing with Alfrey's paintings just two weeks ago at Southampton City Art Gallery. And when I speak, the, the word, my, my whole script is an ethnodrama, so it's narratives verbatim. So when I was saying Lieutenant Alfrey's words, I was saying them while looking at his own pictures. And I can't actually tell you what that was like. So Alfre says, I, I should be glad if I might continue to hold the, the official position of an official painter unpaid and retain my facilities for the purpose of publication and exhibition of my work. And I spoke those words um, to his own paintings. So this really goes back to a wonderful... Um, uh, article that was written by W.J.T. Uh, oh, his name escapes me now. Uh, Mitchell. And he wrote a paper called What Do Pictures Really Want? And that prompted Chris Gostin to write a paper called What Do Objects Really Want? Well, that's what I asked my research participants. I said, what do you think ML-286 wants? What does this vessel want? And Every one of my research participants said, I think she wants to be left alone, she wants to be remembered, but she's a retired veteran and she wants to have peace. But at the same time, she wants her story told. And so with my body, I'm able to take the story and stories out of her body. And with my uh, extended materiality of, of her own materiality and the materiality of her ghosts, we're able to take her stories, excavate the stories, while leaving her at peace in situ. So uh, just to end my, my talk, I would just really like to say just a couple of quick thanks to, especially to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, Dr. Simon Gilmore, Jay Dent, who's been just great, um, Dr. Helen Spencer, Surfa, uh, Scarf. Uh, this is just a wonderful opportunity for me. And on a final note, a very, very final note, um, in 1949, my grandparents, Eleanor Isabella Nay Emsley and Leonard Taylor, Taylor Sr., emigrated from Aberdeen to Vancouver, Canada with their four sons, Leonard, Alan, Lawrence, and Irvin, my father being the eldest. And they would have been really delighted about today. Thank you.